Well, you already mentioned, you know, your Motown. <laughs> yes. of course, that, I just want people to know that is Detroit not my era. <laughs> don't let Carrie, <laughs> don't let Carrie mess with y'all. You're gonna have people be like, oh, Jamal is so, you look so young. Jamal, you're 16. No, no, no. She, Jamal is 64, and she doesn't <laughs> want anyone to know. And she, Jamal, stop it. You look good. You black don't crack. Tell her Thank you. Go ahead. Appreciate it, Carrie. Uh-huh. We don't talk about, you know, representation and, and how important it is and how much it means to people, you know, enough. And I see, I see the both of you, I see your show. I think about my family, my upbringing, uh, single parent household, my mom, my sister, my grandmother, my auntie, all these strong, you know, women and influential um, uh, Black figures in my life. And I'm curious for you, growing up, you know, there's the classic, you know, representation, you know, especially nowadays, Barack Obama and the Oprah's and people like that. But uh, give me, Jamel, give me an example of someone who who you saw in a role that you didn't typically see that, that may have inspired you. Well, I mean, it, I guess, uh, you know, I was raised, um, you know, by some very strong Black women in, in my family. And so I think when you grow up in that dynamic, the the gender lines don't really apply to you because you're used to seeing women have to frankly be mother and father. And so my mom was mother and father and whatever else I needed in between. My grandmother was the same way. My great aunt, she was the same way. And so there was this consistent line of women in my family who had who were independent, who were used to having, mm-hmm. having to figure everything out for themselves. And they certainly did not... Um, they did not dismiss the help of men. It's just that if they sat around and waited for a man to help, nothing would get done. So, <laughs> um, and that's no, you're right. And that's no, you know, kind of shot at, at, at men, but it's, it's the truth. It's like, you know, um, there were some absences that were in there that kind of put them in some certain situations. And as a result, they had to learn to adapt and learn to be the breadwinners of their families. And also, um, you know, the counselors and, you know, mama, daddy, grandpa, all that in between, you know, I, I stand on some very sturdy and wondrous shoulders. So that's really my, you know, inspiration. And I mean, sure, there have been, I can name celebrities that have, but the fact is the celebrities were people that were so far away from my daily existence, the people mm-hmm. in my life on a day-to-day basis. Um, yeah, because I think about this often as I go grocery shopping, like a small example is that um, and I don't say this trying to, to brag, but I can't remember the last time I looked at the price of something, right? And then I think you about how bragging, I grew up. though, but you I am bragging. not bragging. I am not. But you are, I'm, bringing this, I, I'm I, bringing this full circle. I can't remember the last time I, 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 I like, really looked at something. That I cared about what it as, as I bring it full circle, I think about how my mother, when she was on food stamps, was getting like less than $200 for the month, right? No. And so, yeah. you know, I, I got like a, a treat was getting, you know, two six packs of Capri Sun and you had to make them joints last a whole month. <laughs> so you had to take two sips a day and that's just what it was, right? <laughs> and so I, I think about that and just, just the limited resources she had and she was pregnant at 18 years old and I just, I don't know how she did it, you know? But I you mean, still, she still has some of that in her, guys. Michael, don't let her fool you. She still has some of that in her. <laughs> <laughs> she say she I still have left my hood instincts yeah she got Carrie. the cup of noodle in full stock at the house if we need it it's there we going hard don't be trying to be so bougie <laughs> oh I, oh I, I, I got hard. some I got some chef boy ID in the, in the in the pantry don't get it twisted I think um for me and representation wasn't so obvious but when you look back on it I wasn't I wasn't as aware of what my mother was doing until I was an adult but I think for me the first time that I ever saw someone look like me was a local news reporter I grew up in LA so it was a local news reporter um and her name was Lisa Black I don't know if that was her real last name but it was interesting because I was like wow look at her and then it was Oprah um but Oprah for for whatever reasons really translated to me because you know, as we tell how old we are, I was, you know, how your mom, you, black mama tell you go turn the TV, call you from your room to, to the living room to turn the TV, stop <laughs> turning the TV. And then I, and I stopped when I saw Oprah and I was like, oh my goodness, who's this woman? She was just full of life. And I just was, I was transfixed and I didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to do that, right? I knew I wanted to do whatever she was doing. And I couldn't articulate it at seven years old, but there were all these different moments in my life where I, I remember just being the only one, whether I got bus to school. So I live in LA, I got bus to school in the Valley. 
So I'd get up an hour and a half to go to school with people who didn't look like me. And they would be like, so tell me about the Blacks. You know, kids didn't know any better. And they'd be like, do you live in downtown LA next to Skid Row? I always felt like I was representing Black people no matter what I did, even at a young age. So representation for me looked a lot like me being one of the first and, and, and fitting in and trying to fit in and then realizing that there was no such thing as fitting in. Like my, my, my being was to stand out and that was what was special. So I think what I do now though, in terms of representation, I specifically go out of my way to try to understand that when you see, especially when I first came to ESPN, Jamel and I talked about this, when you see people who look like you, it's really important. Just being there is a revolutionary act. Although I may not have been as integral as I wanted to be when I was on first take, just sitting in that position was revolutionary. Um, and you realize that when you meet young girls that come up after you or women after you who want to do the same thing, uh, and not just black and brown girls, but just the, the idea of a woman being in, in the room and being comfortable and being in the room. And so now for me, representation is all that matters. I feel like everything we do, all the work that we do, everything that we've done is to make sure that we're holding the door open for those who don't look like us in terms of people who want to be in the world that we are in. Yes, they may be black, but they don't know how to get in that world. They don't know how to do what we're doing right now. And, and if they see us being our true authentic selves, as much as we possibly can be, then I think that's inspiring. On that, don't don't laugh. But when I and this is gonna sound like I'm I'm cracking a joke after on a serious topic, but I started in radio, and when I saw Martin on WZUP, like <laughs> just seeing a brother on the radio with a microphone, yeah. I don't was you know yeah. sitcom show whatever. Sure. Um, that, that, How many brothers wanted to go into advertising after Boomerang? And I, I, right, I right, yeah. right, right. Like <laughs> right, right, right. Real thing. Um, you know, Ahmad, I'm watching uh, inside stuff with Ahmad Rashad. You know, wanted me to you know get in sports mm -hmm. and do an interview and or, or whatnot. Um, I'll start with you, Jamal. How did you, you know, you you've done a, a lot of things. You continue to do a lot of different things, but uh, specifically with sports journalism and sports broadcasting. You know what got you interested in that in that path? Growing up, I was the neighborhood tomboy, so I love playing sports, and um, I always had a natural affinity for it. You know, back then I had a little bit of speed; <laughs> I could actually <laughs> play a few things. So I was a pretty decent athlete, and that also uh, was great in, in terms of preparing me to to constantly being being in a company of men and having to when being around me and having to stand your ground and. Uh, being able to give it as good as you got it, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I mean, I, people are, people often ask me about, you know, some of my clapbacks on Twitter, well, I was like, well, I started on Asbury Park back in, you know, the mid 80s, okay, mm, <laughs> because mm, mm. if you wanted to hang around the, the boys on the block or whatever, you had to, you couldn't be sensitive, and you had to be able to, to take and, and, and dish out just as much, so uh, it started from there, and I also was a voracious uh, reader as well. Uh, had a library card. Um, matter of fact, that reminds me, I need to really get on one here in, in Los Angeles because this is so far the first city I've lived in, and I haven't had one. But I, I used to read quite a bit, and so I had an appreciation for the English language and for writing and for prose, if you will. And so um, then, for as well, me. during that time, you got to you had to read the newspaper in order to follow your favorite sports teams. And so, being a big sports fan. I also started to read the newspaper. And when I took a high school journalism class, I kind of put all those elements together and realized that I wanted to be a journalist, but in particular, I wanted to pursue sports. So started working for my high school newspaper and uh, got an apprenticeship um, at the local paper, the Detroit Free Press. And I was kind of off to the races after that. So I was really fortunate in that I knew very early on that, that sports journalism is what I wanted to do. Uh, the broadcasting stuff was like a real, uh, was purely an accident. And it was driven by the fact that people on TV made a lot of money. Writers did not. <laughs> <laughs> Writers, I mean, back, to, was, back to the fact, Michael, that she hasn't looked at a bill since she's been to the <laughs> That's why I Because I started making her. that TV money. That's because I started making that TV money. That was why. That's Because trust me, had I still been at a newspaper, I would have been sitting there clipping coupons and been like, you know what? <laughs> The peas on sale for fifty nine cent this week, so I'm gonna go back Friday. to that. We right. we are in a recession <laughs> slash pandemic. You better, you better, you better. Yeah. So it's like I, um, you know, the the roots of that are are much different in, in broadcasting. Like that was just a happy accident 
the product of being at ESPN because mm -hmm. one of the beauties of going to a place like ESPN is that they have so many platforms and you know, they never turn down people wanting to do extra work, particularly when it's, <laughs> they don't have to pay for it. So, yeah, you know, work out. as I be, do it all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keep working. So as I, when I, I came to ESPN, not as a broadcaster, as a writer, I was a columnist for ESPN.com. And eventually I started to make more appearances on TV on shows like First Take. And, you know, one producer sees you, next thing you know, they're all calling you and asking you to be on. And next thing you know, I'm, hosting a, a show, a daily show with one of my good friends and Michael Smith. And next thing you know, we're doing sports center. And next thing you know, I'm not there anymore. So <laughs> I still have to say is, uh, yes, it was um, the print journal journalism was the only thing I wanted to do. My dream job was actually to work at Sports Illustrated. ESPN was never on my vision board um, because that's where the writers went. And that's where I felt like the best sports journalism was done. So um, so yeah, I mean, it was uh, a, a very planned route, but I can say surprisingly and happily that probably the last 10 years of my career, I've made a ton of moves that I never expected to make within journalism and, and broadcasting, I would count in that group. It's like, I didn't want to be on TV. Print people look down on people on TV. So that was <laughs> never my, my, that was never my plan and my goal. Cause you know, we're so elitist sometimes in our thinking. So we used to be like, look at those TV people thinking that they all better than everybody else with their little makeup and sauntering on television. And Lord, look, I look up and I was like, I don't enjoy, enjoy the dark side because nobody showed yeah. me. Enjoy the like. dark side. <laughs> right. you, got a, you got a makeup artist. You got a hairstylist. I'm saying. So all look what y'all have turned me into. You all <laughs> I don't know out. myself anymore. Yeah, I know. Who are you? Who are you, woman? Uh, mm -hmm. Kara, when did you know sports was something you just wanted to get involved with uh, from a broadcasting standpoint? Well, I started off as a local journalist. So I, whatever my beat was, was what I loved. So it didn't really matter. I had always been, I came to this just as a true fan. Um, so I was a local one-man band in West Virginia, worked my way up, did all the stuff I had to do, you know, to, to really figure it out, jump from market to market. And then I finally got to Atlanta. And then when I was in Atlanta, a couple of things happened. One, well, no, I'd say in West Palm, we started covering the Serena, the Williams sisters, Serena specifically, um, and, and golf. So those are the things that are huge in Florida, golf and tennis. So I was always on that beat, probably because I was black, but it just made sense. And so I would always cover that. And I thought, okay, this is my four way, it, you know, my Fourier, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, into it but <laughs> then I was like okay I covered it good loved it then I went to Atlanta and then I started covering the Hawks and then I started covering the Falcons and then the Dream and it just it all made sense but I was a local news reporter like that's all I cared about I my end game was supposed to be standing on the White House lawn uh, for CNN you know talking about what's going on in the world that was where it was supposed to be although sports was always in my life because uh, I was a fan of specifically basketball, the Lakers, and I don't think many people know that about me. And <laughs> as, a, um, as a Laker fan, I remember thinking, because I ended up working at Tennis Channel, um, and then I was like, oh, I should go. This is literally what I said in my head. I liked Tennis Channel. It was great. I traveled the world. I knew everything. It was great. I loved it. And I was like, I should probably go and work for ESPN if I want to do tennis the right way. But in my mind, I was just going to go and cover the Lakers. It was just that simple. I was like, I'm just going to go ahead and cover the Lakers for them. And I don't want to gonna do a freelance and then I'll just figure out some other stuff. It was just really that simple in my mind, in my silly, naive mind. But naivete is a wonderful thing. Um, and then I went out to Bristol on my own two cents. And I was like, okay. I was meeting people, talking to people. And they were like, we're going to call you back. It was like a year later, but a lot of calling and touching base and then they called and they were like hey do you want to host this show called first take and I'm like wait I was supposed to be a Lakers freelance reporter because I love Lakers that's all I wanted to talk about <laughs> if I had my own beat well you know as a as a, a local reporter my beat just would have been the Lakers like I, I'm all good I don't need to do anything else that would have been heaven <laughs> for me. it would have been a, I would have been the most annoying reporter but it would have been heaven that's all I had to do um, and then so we you know it, it worked out the way it was supposed to work out I think for me the reason why I transitioned to sports after local news, two things. One, I was so over local news, right? I was just so bored with covering whatever it may have been. And then two, I wanted to kind of create a name for myself. And I knew that if I were to stay in local news, I'd be doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. And for me, it helped me stand out more um, in terms of telling stories. So I went in just under the concept of telling great stories. 
um, it evolved from just telling great labor stories to telling stories, period. Um, and I was able to do what I what I love, which is that at its core, I'm just a journalist and I like to tell stories. I like to talk to people, I like to get to know people. Um, and then it became more, you know, Jamal just said she she has done things with her broadcasting career and her career as a journalist she never thought of. It always happens that way. One thing leads to another and it just unfolds and you find out what your sweet spot is and where you live and what you're good at doing. Um, and and ultimately you you wake up one day, you know, after being at, you know, the sports leader for eight years and you're like, I'd like to do something else. I'd like to, I'd like to take this the hunger that I have for journalism and tell stories that are affecting our people right now in a very urgent way that needs to be talked about. And I can't sit on the sidelines and just look at it casually. I gotta be out there. And so that was my, my come to Jesus moment, if you will. Now, your friend to the left, Jamal, had always been telling me, girl, go on and do it, go on, go on and do it. And I was like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. And then I finally did, because at the end of the day, for me, Michael, it is about telling stories and making an impact. The TV thing is great. The working with a great friend is amazing. But, you know, at your core, when you're a journalist, you know that all you want to do, in Jamal's case, is write and really imprint and, and tell, capture great stories. In my case, is to make sure that I'm giving subject matter that can be digested by the viewer, that I am telling the stories that matter, that I'm speaking for those who can't speak for themselves. And if I'm able to do that on any platform, I'm just grateful. Two versions, your version, Carrie's version, uh, Jamel. Um, how did the idea for Carrie and Jamel won't stick to sports come about? It's only uh, one version. It really is only one. We will tell. It's only the one version. version. Okay. But, <laughs> mm, yeah, no, it's not much different. It, it's uh, it's Sweet. where all great ideas are born from Pinot Noir. So that's how yeah. it's, it's really how it came up. By. So I was, I went to her house to jump her. Uh, like, Carrie, like a um, yeah. the Carrie had been, and I was on fighter. She was, she, <laughs> tell she, them that part. She was gonna fight me with Bella Gloss, Pinot Noir. Yes, uh -huh, that, that uh -huh. was what it was. Um, but no, um, the, the Carrie had been saying forever, and we had always felt that at some point we would work together and do something. But, you know, I was just kind of caught up in the day to day of what I was doing in, in my own kind of world. And Carrie, um, being the good friend that she is, decided mm -hmm. that we needed a kick in the pants. And that kick in the pants was her showing up with the camera crew and some wine and being like, we're going to put something on video so that we mm -hmm. can, you know, turn this into some kind of sizzle reel so we can show people that we can have good conversations. We have great chemistry. We're obviously really good friends. So she really was the driving force and the engineer, you know, behind it. And because she's such a good friend, she let me come along for the ride. So that is yeah. really how it started. <laughs> no, so I'm gonna give you guys the real version of it. This is, yeah, there is two versions. You're right, my yeah, bad. Okay. <laughs> I got tired of her being so trifling. And so. <laughs> okay, okay, but that's real, that's real. And so she gets on my nerves. And so I'm just looking down thoughtful. No, uh, this is what, I, she's absolutely right. The true story is that I did knock on her door. Wait, hold on. My bun is bothering me. Do you mind? <laughs> I want this on the outtake. <laughs> okay. So what happened was, what had happened was that Jamel and I used to do, what was it called back in the day when we were in Bristol? Periscope. I'm mad you said back Periscope. in the day. Stop it. Back in the day. You know what? <laughs> Kids, Periscope. It's been, it's been forever. This thing called Periscope. We would do Periscopes all the time because we were always so bored. Like, honestly, we had nothing to do. Like, we would just sit around and watch football games all day, all Saturday and Sunday. Our lives were around events. So we would just Periscope and we would call it the auntie Periscoping. And people loved it. And we thought it was funny. And we knew there was something there. And obviously... I would come on his and hers and she would, and I'd be on their podcast and on their show and she would come on Sports Center when she was in LA. So we, it was just, it just made sense for us to always kind of connect and do something because we always have these real life stories that we can tell on air, but we know not to go too far. We just know to look at each other and be like, okay, <laughs> don't do that right now. I'm married. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, I was like, um, hey, let's, put together a pilot just us talking about it was going to be called one more like because we like mm -hmm. drink wine so we want to put together a pilot of us just sipping wine and talking about everything and we talked about everything we talked about Jay-Z and what was going on with the NFL and whether or not Colin Kaepernick had a point and was Jay-Z wrong we talked about voting for Trump and how both of our family members significant family her mother my grandmother voted for Trump we talked about all these different issues um, under the guise of 
just just keeping it real. And it was more me interviewing her because Jamel's more of an, an opinionist than I was at the time, but I have an opinion. Like, this is why we always laugh because people are like, Carrie has an opinion. She's like, girl, no, she has too much of an opinion. So <laughs> we did put this pilot together and it just so happens like months later, we bumped into some folks and they were like, um, Vice is looking to do a show. And it just so happened we had this pilot, but they wanted to make it something else. And then we came back with what we wanted and we were able to, we, I mean, like all happy marriages, you were able to compromise. But the idea of it was like, you can't tell us we can't talk about all of these things as journalists and our life experiences and what we've written about and reported on make us more than qualified. So that was the whole point of putting it together. But it literally started me just knocking on her door with a bottle of red wine, as she mentioned, some Bella Gloss. Mm-hmm. Is it Bella Gloss? It was Bella Gloss, yeah. My favorite. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Carrie, tell me about your foundation, Brown Girls Dream. I remember waking up one day and not feeling like um, I had any mentors. Like a lot of your mentors don't necessarily look like you, but it would be nice if they did. And I remember all these young girls would always email me or hit me up on social media and say, can you mentor me or how'd you get in the business? I felt very overwhelmed, but I also felt obligated to to respond and try to help in whatever way I could. So one day, um, again, that's why you just have to do things and just do it and not think twice about it. I was like, I'm going to create a website and then I'm going to ask all my girlfriends to help me mentor a bunch of young girls. And I'm just going to put this on my social media account. I'll put it on IG and say, apply. And we're going to pick 20 girls and we'll see what happens. So I called up all my girlfriends who are living large in whatever aspect of life, one of them being Jamal Hill. Can you be a mentor? I don't know who I'm going to give you, but can you be a mentor? Uh, my friend Bozema St. John, she's the CMO of Netflix. Can you be a mentor? Our friend Kelly Carter, she's a writer, senior writer at ESPN Undefeated. Can you be a mentor? Um, Michelle Turner is an entertainment reporter. The list goes on and on. My friend Christine is the CEO of the Academy. Like I got some bad brown women in my group. Like they are the top of their game. And I'm like, you need to share that gift, right? Because the game is supposed to be given. So I literally asked all of them and not even thinking twice, they all said yes. Um, and the response was amazing. I, the need was imperative and the response was amazing. We've created a sorority, if you will. And the success stories are amazing. And where can people go to get more information? BrownGirlsDream.org, or you can call Jamel at 860-KIDDING. Um, <laughs> BrownGirlsDream.org. I love it. And Jamel, um, Jamel Hill is Unbothered, uh, the podcast for Spotify. What is, what's the best part of doing those, of doing those interviews? Uh, the best part is the, the things you learn about people. Um, interviewing has always been something I've enjoyed. Um, pretty hard not to be a journalist and not love to interview people. You love talking <laughs> to people, um, you know, learning from them, uh, understanding who they are. And it, without fail, there's always somebody every single podcast who tells me something about them that I had no idea or that just completely catches me off guard that winds up spinning off into this other conversation about other things and uh, one of the best compliments I often get on the guests that I have on my podcast is that, you know what, I didn't like this person, but then I listened to him with you and I kind of like them. And while the goal is not to necessarily get them liked, because, you know, their truth is their truth. And it's like, I'm not going to disturb that. And I'm not trying to get you to like them because there's no skin in the game for me. But I just want to present an honest, compelling person who hopefully has something to say. And so um, that part has been, you know, extremely you know, rewarding. And uh, I really enjoyed a lot of it and um, uh, enjoy, enjoyed all of it, but it just feels good to kind of create something from scratch, see it grow and mature. And then uh, I think about those first few podcasts versus where things are now. And it's like a dramatic difference. So um, I'm just happy overall with uh, what I've been able to do uh, in that space. I uh, love my relationship with Spotify. So yeah, it's been, it's been extremely personally rewarding for me. I love it. I love it, folks. To check that out again on Spotify. Um, before before we wrap, I'm in you know Brooklyn, the Nets covering for Yes Network. Um, Carrie, we gonna take Brooklyn you. down in six. Oh geez, here we go. See, you already knew. Why, 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 why did you even do this? Why did you even? That wasn't the question. Okay. That wasn't the question. <laughs> <laughs> you re- you really go with the Lakers over uh, Lakers over the Nets? It's six. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Go ahead. Oh, man. <laughs> let me, let me, I'm going to wrap with this. Is there something that you guys argue about, you know, in a fun way uh, that 
has not made it on air or does not get enough oh, air time. Oh, has not, has not made it on air. Has not okay, made it on air or hasn't gotten enough, <laughs> enough air time. We'll wrap with that. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we talk, the thing is we talk about the argument, the one argument we've had in our friendship, which was based, let's see, this all goes back to Carrie and the Lakers. You know, I mind my own black business and Carrie is, because the Lakers turned Carrie into a different person. I, you know, I knew she was a big fan. I knew it. I knew this throughout our friendship. But it wasn't until I went to a game with her that it really all settled in. And I understand it because I'm a big Michigan State fan, right? And I often tell people, I'm not mature enough to watch Michigan State with other people. Okay, so like, <laughs> this is something I really have yeah. to do with myself. I'll do it with my husband because he always, he went to Michigan State as well. But when I went to that Lakers game with Terry, I was frightened. I was frightened. I was just like, I don't know who ugly. this woman is. It was ugly. It was, it was and ugly. they were good. It wasn't like that. Yeah. It, it was, was like ugly. it was bad. I was like, oh my God. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know this woman. I'd be like, she's insane. And she looked at, <laughs> and she looked that way. She was like terrified. And I was like, maybe I should dial it back. I can't, <laughs> I don't know how. I, and so I've learned the lesson of watching the games by myself. Whenever I go to games now in public, not anymore, but back then, I, I always remind myself, just take a beat. It never works, but it's embarrassing. <laughs> and our fight, was because now this is even more embarrassing. This why and, and by the way, Jamel, I'd like to I'd like to go on the record. Here's some breaking news, guys. Josh and Eric Gregory. Let me make sure I scoot over here. Michael. Um getting all the names. Here's the breaking news about Jamel. She be acting like a big old bad gangster on social media. She is the sweetest thing ever. Cause here's the fight. Stop to stop here's telling people this. <laughs> here's the fight. We were coming home from New York one day. It was late at night. Who knows what we were doing? Something for ESPN. I think we were, we were doing car. some event. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, some event. And we're like, uh, how we got on the topic of who was the better? I don't even know. Isaiah or Magic Johnson? <laughs> Isaiah Thomas or Magic Johnson? How did we get on that topic? I don't even it, know. <laughs> it was. It spiraled into Jamel being like, y'all just mad because he beat y'all. He beat all of them. That's why don't nobody like him. He took one from Larry. He took one from Magic. He took one from Michael. Blah, 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 blah. That's when, and, that's when full Detroit came out. It was like, okay. <laughs> and it was, and it was uncomfortable because then I thought <laughs> I didn't have an answer. And like a true child, I went to personal. You know, people start calling you names because they don't have nothing to say in response to your facts. <laughs> And let me be clear, she wasn't calling me any names, but let's just say names are called of people, of people. Names are called. But Michael, here's where she, where she rides the fence. Clearly she loves Isaiah because of Detroit, but she also loves Magic because of MSU. And she tried to be friends with both of them. And I was like, ride or die, where are you going to live? If you have to pick right I can't now, do it though. I can't face. do it. I, I'm not, I'm not picking between Biggie and Pac. It's not happening. I'm not doing it. <laughs> right? I'm not. And Carrie tried to, she has many times tried to uncomfortably make me make this choice in front of Magic Johnson. I'm like, Carrie, why are you doing this to me? Because she's an evil friend and that's what she would do. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I appreciate you both. No, Thank you so, so much. Michael, put that in there. Michael, put that in there. The last part, Jamel's a horrible human. Put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that. All right. Edit that part. Okay. That's it. You know what? That's why. That's both. why I got that. That's why I got that picture. Of you in that Clippers jersey when you lost that bet <laughs> in my phone. Ooh. So the next time we get around Magic, I'll be like, Magic, ask yourself, would a real Laker fan do this? Uh, you they? know what? Let me ask you, Michael. <laughs> Lakers in six. I'll talk to you then. Okay, home <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that bet. I'll take that bet. <laughs> I appreciate Thank you, you so both. Much Thank you so us. much. We appreciate Thank it. You Thank you so much you. for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate right. it.